So, is air pollution still a problem? It certainly is. In the great smog of 1952, which was very visible, there were over 4,000 deaths due to short-term exposure to visible air pollution. We knew nothing then about the health impacts of long-term exposure to air pollution. And it was only in the last 10 years that the scientists discovered that the health impacts of long-term exposure dwarf those from short-term exposure. And in fact, it was only two years ago that we had our first estimates from the mayor and the government. So the mayor estimated that there are 4,267 early deaths from long-term exposure to invisible air pollution, for example, in the year 2008 alone. So in a sense, we're back where we were, where we thought we were, 60 years ago. The problem is invisible now, but there is still a huge toll from uh, air pollution. So what are the main causes of air pollution in London? There are basically two types of air pollution that we're concerned about. Particles and gases. The particles are typically called by the scientists and the lawyers um, uh, dangerous airborne particles, particulate matter, and they're categorised uh, by their size and they're typically a tenth or a fortieth of the thickness of a human hair so they're really they are truly invisible. Um, for the gases the only gas really that is monitored that is a concern is nitrogen dioxide so not laughing gas it's uh, nitrogen dioxide uh, and this is um, uh, known to be uh, a toxic gas particularly in high concentrations. So are there legal standards that the capital should be abiding by? Yes, these legal standards are based on World Health Organization guidelines. Uh, for the dangerous particles, the legal standard is set at about twice the World Health Organization guideline. For nitrogen dioxide, the legal limit is set at around, it's fairly well aligned with the World Health Organization guideline. Mm -hmm. Basically, near London's busiest roads, air pollution is breached by a factor of two. Um, uh, air pollution laws are breached by a factor of two near our busiest streets. So, for example, um, uh, in Marlborough Road that um, we looked at earlier, um, air pollution is two, even three times at Euston Road compared to the legal limit, the World Health Organization guideline for nitrogen dioxide. For there are annual standards, an annual average, and then you're allowed a certain number of bad air days for the particles and a certain number of bad air hours for nitrogen dioxide. So, so on bad air days, should we be receiving smog alerts? We most certainly should. For example, um, uh, so far in 2012, there have been uh, six smog episodes Another one is actually building at the moment. Uh, last year the government issued a, a smog alert in mid-April and this year we've seen even very high 10 out of 10 levels of air pollution in London but we've had no smog alert from the government or the mayor and that is a national disgrace and the mayor needs to answer why he's not issued those smog alerts and I think the real answer is very likely to be he doesn't want people thinking about air pollution in the run-up to the mayoral election because he's taken backward steps on this issue. So in the run-up to the Beijing Olympics there have been quite a lot of uh, worries about air quality there. Are there going to be air quality worries for the London Olympics? The levels of particles in Beijing were much higher than they are in London but for nitrogen dioxide the, the gas pollutant that we're concerned about levels in London are comparable with those in Beijing before they took action uh, during the two, uh, for the 2008 Olympics. Uh, what we've been told by the, the top lung biologists in the UK is that if we have a smog episode like we had for example in 2003 or 2006, that um, uh, particularly the long distance athletes, the marathon runners and the long distance cyclists, could experience um, uh, a sort of tightness of the chest um, in uh, such an episode uh, if they're competing there. 
Now, for some of the athletes who are asthmatic, and there are many top athletes who are, uh, that the scientists have told us that those people may need to take medication if we have an episode like we had in 2003 or 6. Now, that is not the vision um, that we want to see for the greenest games ever. So, in your view, what are the key solutions to air pollution? Well, the Clean Air in London Manifesto lists five main themes. The first thing we need is real leadership from our mayor, and we've not seen that over the last four years on this issue. We need the mayor to be saying this is the biggest public health crisis after smoking, um, and uh, going out and telling people he's going to do something about it, and then following through with action. The second thing we need to do is clean up London's transport, so the buses, the taxis, um, uh, and even um, uh, the London Underground cleaner in London is concerned about the air quality in that also. So we need to clean up London's transport. We also need to reduce harmful emissions from buildings. We don't want to be burning wood chips or um, uh, wood or coal, for example, as some um, people are starting to do again. And then we need to protect the most vulnerable because um, the most vulnerable people can be exposed to up to 50% more air pollution than uh, the, the better off uh, people. And then the last thing is we need to ensure that we achieve a legacy from the Olympic Games for the greenest games ever. So those are the five key things that we need to be doing. But what we should do is really start with a major campaign to build public understanding of the dangers of air pollution with advice for people about how they can protect themselves, for example, walk down side streets rather than busy roads, and how they can reduce pollution for themselves and others. Okay. Thanks for your time. It's a great pleasure.